Tesla plus the tunnels, Tesla plus everything, Tesla plus autonomy. But you know what? There is a whole lot of money to be saved by doing things just slightly differently. And that's why I brought back John Twig to talk with me about it. This is part two, the thrilling conclusion of our discussion about how the boring tunnels could change absolutely everything. I'm Brian. Welcome to Future Aza. So, John, in the in-between, we were talking about some of the ways that this could save a fortune. Now, we've already discussed that tunnels themselves can be dug cheaper. Just the smaller diameter, like you would see with a London Tube rather than a giant multi-lane car tunnel, is a monumental savings. The economies of scale of, of having many uh, boring machines run built back-to-back, running simultaneously, huge savings. But... We were in the in-between show talking about some of the ways we can trim costs on the cars themselves. Uh, let's start with tires. Well, let, let's go back a step first and just sure. think of the way that Tesla work at the moment, that they do a lot of different things, including optimizing the motors, the regenerative braking, and the cooling, and any one of those things might be relatively small. But what we get is a compounding effect that means actually, well, we've, we've got two electric cars here at home. We've got a Renault Zoe, which is a very small car, which probably you wouldn't even recognize as a car over there in the US. It's so small. Uh, and a Model Y. They use about the same amount of electric per mile, which is just staggering because one is so much bigger than the other. So what we've got is compounding effects that the more you join them together, the more, and then obviously one of the things we get is you can have a smaller battery uh, because you're more efficient, which means less weight. It's a virtuous circle. If we then move into a tunnel, we then see a whole lot more benefits. If we, We've also got the uh, robo vans potentially, which could work in the tunnels. So we could have... Uh, far more p people per vehicle, which is inherently a better thing to do. But we're going to have, as we've talked a little bit last time, that uh, a robo taxi in a tunnel will wear far less on the surface. It's going to go around corners uh, more easily. There aren't as many corners for a start. The acceleration won't be as uh, intense. So you're doing everything almost perfectly in terms of the optimization of the energy to travel a, a mile or 10 miles or however we, far you're going. So all of those things then start to compound. You get a smaller battery again. Uh, we could even look at the road surface. The road surface won't wear. We're not going to get big potholes. I do you call them potholes in, over there. Yep. Uh, in terms of the road surface breaking up with ice and the weather. Uh, one of the very biggest elements, I think you've probably looked at the different models uh, when you're ordering a Tesla. And one of the mm -hmm. things you can do is choose a bigger or a smaller wheel. It's surprising how much difference it makes that if you take the smaller wheel, I think on a Model Y, it's something like 30 miles more maximum range. It's quite a bit. Now, it might that, be 20, but it's, it's quite yeah, a bit. It's significant. And the reason is those wheels are very heavy. A Tesla needs to go around a corner, at, in theory, up to around 150 miles an hour for some of the bigger ones. They're big wheels, they're big, heavy steel, uh, the very, very big, heavy tire itself. If you're in a tunnel, you're not going around corners quickly. You're not accelerating quickly. The surface is smooth. Uh, it might, well, if you look, just look at the train wheel, they can be really totally solid. Now, we're not saying we'd have a totally solid wheel, but the tires could be much smaller, much lighter. The, Wheels are not going to have impact over bumps, so they don't need to be as heavy and strong. So we can potentially, and they could be smaller wheels, which makes the whole effect even better. So, and, and smoother and more efficient, yes. So we're, we're looking at far less energy to accelerate the car because we don't accelerate as much. The wheels are smaller and lighter. The battery can therefore be, I can imagine a, a robo taxi van could come in with something ridiculous like a 40 kilowatt battery and still have really good range because it doesn't need to accelerate and it doesn't stop and start it's going to go directly from start to finish right at a predictable speed well what if there's congestion at the next tunnel uh it knows that and it will slow down in the tunnel to get through that station when the traffic is cleared and 
to to your point on the tires, they don't need to be all weather. They need to be one weather, yes. the optimal weather. They don't need to be high, high grip because there's not going to be a need for hard acceleration or hard braking. They don't need the most powerful motors because it really doesn't take much horsepower to operate at the sort of speed you would expect to not spill people's things all over the interior of a cab and all of yes all of those things you could put on tires that would last 70 80 hundred thousand miles yeah. and the driving style would be such that uh, it wouldn't be aggressive enough to wear them unduly and of course the same thing applies to the body of the car no no weather no ice so cars themselves will last much longer uh, there's going to be very little wear. Maybe you'd replace the seats every so often, something like that. Well, I don't know that we would reach the scale where purpose-built vehicles would be made. But yes, you don't need airbags if there are no collisions. Then the vehicle gets lighter and cheaper still. Uh, but that's such a small that's such a small per ride cost over the life of the vehicle that it hardly matters. And to your point about because it's so much more efficient, it could use a smaller battery. Then you get to use an LFP battery, which is rated for a million, four million miles, and you can charge it to a hundred uh, during off peak times. Very easily done. Uh, there's, it just starts to get a little crazy to think about. Um, I do want to address the people real quick who say, Oh great. You invented a, a train, but worse. It's not a train. This is not ideally suited for every application. This is not going to replace the subway system. This would be for specifically starting in places where a subway system doesn't make sense because it's too big. The capacity is too high. It's too expensive. And this is not but worse. It's but better because it's point to point. There is no changing trains at the station. There is no I'm on the wrong platform. You just get in a car and you arrive at your destination. Yes, I'd argue a little bit or disagree. Please, please. That a train, it's point to point. And obviously, I'm agreeing with you so far that that doesn't solve what we call the last mile problem of actually reaching uh, places one, two miles away from the station. You've got to change, get a taxi, do all sorts of things. So the cars are much more flexible because they're point to point. But imagine we get a van that carries perhaps 16 people, we've got convoy mode. They're all running FSD. There's no reason we can't effectively build a train of 10 or 20 when we need extremely high volume, but they just break apart at, at the start and the end to deliver people to their particular destinations. So we actually get the best of both worlds. Uh, nothing worse than seeing a large train, uh, which must be using a lot of energy traveling empty uh, with the cars it's completely flexible we build trains on the spot whenever we need them so there's a when seattle was looking at their uh transit options they went with light rail mm. and it it's been it's been 24 years and the train that was supposed to be done in a, about four or five has finally reached the suburb of linwood good job guys good job mm. and it was insane that we went with light rail the suggestion that i had seen at the time was to follow i don't remember if it was sydney or melbourne but they had uh what they did instead was it looks like light rail but it's actually buses so it's got its own dedicated lanes and all that mm. similar to a tunnel but then when it gets the end it gets on the surface streets and gets out into the places where you couldn't possibly put a dedicated lane and it uh works but of course why follow something that works when you can spend 24 years uh, getting a distance that you could drive in about 25 minutes? So that's really, really amazing uh, spending on the part of uh, the yeah. uh, light rail authority there, the regional transit authority in Washington state. But uh, yeah, there's, but if we, if you do take those boring uh, vehicles and take them out of the tunnel, then you've got, then you're right back to needing all those other things. Oh. Uh, so the, it yeah, it'd be interesting to see uh, how big of, a, of an obstacle is a wind resistance uh, on the surface versus a tunnel. Well, if if you talk to the people that know about these things, these physics people, etc., and I think most a lot of Tesla people are quite technical. The majority of the energy that you use while traveling at a constant speed. Uh, which actually is most of the energy used, because that's what you do most of the time, the energy you need to do that increases with the square of the speed. So if you're traveling at 60 miles an hour, 60 uh, times 60, 
3,600. But if you move up to 90, you're looking at 8,100. It goes up very significantly. So the first thing is a robo taxi is not likely to be traveling at 90 miles an hour, uh, at least in city tunnels. Uh, potentially could be in, in, in intercity tunnels later on. But they're quite likely to be traveling at 30, 40, 50 miles an hour, so much slower. So the energy use is going to be lower. But something really interesting happens as well, that if you've ever been in the subway, I know it, down in the London underground, I've been a few times, and when the train arrives, you get a significant amount of air pushed out of the tunnel. So the air in the tunnels is constantly moving. Even if we took a relatively conservative estimate and said the air, even with lots of cars moving through the tunnels, is going to be traveling at 10 miles an hour, that is the equivalent of reducing the amount of energy needed from, for example, 50 miles an hour to 40 miles an hour. So 50, let's say 5 squared is 25 and 4 is 16. We're going to reduce the amount of energy we need by a third or so, just by having the air moving through the tunnel. When we're on a road, of course, what happens is that energy is just wasted because the energy is pushed, uh, the air is pushed out around the road, and we've got no way of recapturing that. But what happens in the tunnel is one car goes through the tunnel and pushes the air, and all the other cars in the tunnel that are nearby benefit from that work. So they're actually sharing that energy. Uh, so if we combine the tires, uh, the battery size, the air resistance, we could potentially be looking at energy use of around a tenth. And I know that sounds crazy, but around one tenth of the energy we would use on a, let's say, an ice car on the surface. Ridiculously cheap to operate. One of you, and, it, and it makes sense if you just think about it, because uh, there will be a slightly higher pressure zone ahead of the lead car with a slightly lower pressure zone behind it and a slightly lower pressure behind. I mean, it just it keeps getting better uh so yes. that's and if we've got a circle there isn't a lead car it's a constantly moving well system. that's what i mean is yeah. is the lead car would be the first one of the day yes and then every car after that would would just be a uh a middle segment mm. of the human centipede as it were pretty sure that's the analogy we're going to go with it, it is uh, <laughs> now i'm not an expert and i don't know how much energy you would save and how fast that air oh, would go, but it's going to make I a thought... difference I thought you meant you weren't an expert on human centipedes because that's all right. I've got a guy coming on later for that. Yeah, I've got two legs. I'm any more than that, and I get confused. I got you. That makes sense. On the boring tunnel, um, so let's talk about what this can do to the economy. That was something that we had touched on early in the first show. Uh, what can this do to the economy? Well, th this is very much in sync with Optimus uh, doing a lot of work around the city, all these different places, reducing the cost of labor. We've now, potentially in the long term, we've got the, the marginal cost of transport getting so low that that's moving towards zero as well. So it becomes extremely easy uh, to scale the production of goods, move them around at more reasonable prices. Everybody can move around far more easily if we want to work in a different city, uh, if we want to just visit. Almost everything starts to scale. Uh, the challenge, of course, as we talked about in the first one, is that if we were to try and do that on roads, it would quickly become chaos, uh, unsustainable. But if we can open up the system with these tunnels, uh, we potentially, with Optimus Tunnels, Tesla, maybe even SpaceX, if you want to travel around the world, you build a tunnel out to an island where you take off, go to Australia. We, we're opening up networks and movement of people and goods around the world to be far more effective. Uh, it's difficult to envisage where it stops. It, it goes so far. It's crazy to think about. Do you have any expectations of what we're going to actually see on, on 1010? Do you, how far along do you think we are? Did you see the post on x from the from the tesla ai team that's an aggressive timeline and that's not elon saying it that's the actual team saying it which to me gives it a little more credibility because elon's very optimistic i'll ask you am i right if is that the first time we've ever seen that kind of forward looking from from that department, I have never seen anything so concrete from them. Yeah. I've only yeah, and forward looking. They yeah. usually say here here's what happened yesterday. Here's what's happened 
today. Um, this rollout started, it's going. So what, what that suggests is that all of the things that we're seeing in that post tweet is already almost there internally, or they wouldn't be saying Su it. Sufficiently close that I think yeah. you can count on it. Uh, yes. Yeah, because if you look at like, one of the problems I've heard is that uh, auto park gets a little too close to the uh, curbside, mm. to the curb. Mm. And that was also true of 12.3.6. They fixed it on the next iteration like two weeks later. That seems to be an easy problem to address. Um, the, so, most, the most uh, significant part of Elon's tweets in the last couple of days is that we will actually probably, hopefully, have FSD supervised in the UK and the rest of Europe over the next six to nine months. So that uh, while you've been worried about not getting smart summon, uh, I've been <laughs> worried about not having anything uh, other than a really basic autopilot. So that's really exciting. What do I personally think will happen? I'm biased because uh -huh. as I've looked at these tunnels and vans and the, the capacity of what we could achieve with them, I would really like to see a van that's going to be ultra configurable Elon actually said that at one point, didn't he? Maybe we should make a, an ultra configurable van uh, that could be used. And we've seen something come through via Australia and various applications that the seats might spin and recline almost to seats, uh, all those kind of things. So that would be wonderful. For me, that opens up so many, many possibilities of a van that you can sleep in overnight while it takes you to the other side of the country, uh, right through to high volume movement of people through tunnels. Uh, Will we get it? I don't know. Will we get the van? Will we get the two-seater uh, that we've seen mock-ups of? Uh, maybe they're deliberately misleading us uh, to, to hide what's coming. I don't know. But, but the other thing that I hope we get is, and, and I'm with uh, Kathy and all of her people, that I want to see a robo-taxi network even before we can have, uh, or rather I want to see a taxi network uh, where, because they're saying who would put their car on? Well, I would. I bought my car knowing it would hopefully be a taxi. Uh, I would be really happy to spend two hours in an evening instead of wasting that because I'm tired going on Netflix. I could go out for two hours. I could help Tesla define the network, find the routes, what works, what doesn't uh, in supervised mode. And I think there are a lot of people uh, that's not to say 90% or even if it's 10% of Tesla owners would love to go out and help uh, and make some money while they're doing it. So I can imagine the taxi network being a way of scaling the the system, having people book rides, do all of those things, get it up to. So it's the, the other thing is getting started is a challenge if it's going to be totally robo taxi. If we can just turn them on and have people uh, in supervised mode to get started, you've got a really simple way of beginning the scaling process. Uh, and also the people can talk to the passengers, uh, talk about it, explain things. Uh, yeah. I think yeah. We've and, got an uh, interesting it, uh, it, way it, forward. Yeah. And you're right. It doesn't need to be 90%. Um, even, even 10%, we're talking a lot. We're talking hundreds of thousands of vehicles. Yeah. That's, that's, that's enough for a start. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, in terms of a van, my question in the comments would be, which configuration would you be most excited about? There is a straight cargo. There is half seating, half cargo. That's great for a work crew. There is, um, you know, like a festival kind of, I don't know what you call it, like limo, well, bus, where it's where it seats on the side and poles to hold on to, to stand up, maximum capacity. Captain's chairs, uh, RV, what is the most exciting form figure form factor for you guys. Uh, this can is I very ask, exciting. Can yes. I ask a question that when they say ultra configurable, does that mean, and we don't, I, don't, I don't know the answer, I'm really curious, that in the factory they can produce lots of different configurations, or does it mean even more than that, that they can actually be swapped? One lot of seats taken out, another one put in. So oh. if, you, if you've got one of these oh. and you've got a small business, you could choose, uh, get them swapped out depending on what you need it for. You could change it after purchase, you mean? Yeah. Um, so, yes, I think there would be some amount of that. Mm. Although if you're going to be using it as walking space, the rails that hold mm. things in place would have to be different. You'd probably need a double set of double rails so that you could have individual seats, 
but also a bench. And they would need to be far enough to the sides that you could walk in between. But I don't see why you couldn't do that. Now, of course, configuring for an RV, that's all on you, consumer. Mm. Just get the cargo variant and go from there. I think the only question would be, does it have windows or not uh, from the factory? And that's, you know, just like with cargo vans today, you yeah. can get them with or without windows. Yeah. Uh, so... But yeah, very interesting questions. Uh, guys, in the comments, what did we miss? What did we misunderstand? How excited are you that we were able to get John back to join us to talk about this? All of this uh, is an article up on X that John ran uh, not too long ago. Link in the description. Uh, and yeah, uh, like, subscribe, do the usual. And everybody else, stay tuned, stay juicy. And I cannot wait to hear from you clever robots in the land of the mole men, which is, of course, underground.